Today we're going to talk about revenue models. Very simply is, how does your company make money? So in our last lectures, we talked about value proposition, customer segments, distribution channels, customer relationships, get keeping and growing customers. But today, we're going to be talking about revenue streams. How is it that you make money? Now, revenue models uh, seems incredibly simple. It answers the question, how does the company make money from each customer segment? But one of the things that we always tend to confuse is the difference between a revenue model and pricing. That is the amount of dollars that we might actually charge for the product. And this is a common mistake. What we're really trying to understand first is what value is the customer paying for? And the first thing we need to figure out is, what is our revenue model? What's the revenue stream? That's our strategy. But what follows is then pricing. What is our tactics? So again, what we're going to try to figure out is what's our strategy, revenue streams, and what's our tactics, pricing. And together, that means how do we as a company make money from each customer segment? Let me just remind you that the reason why I love this lecture is that there's a series of common mistakes that first-time and even experienced entrepreneurs make in thinking about revenue and pricing. And the first one is that this whole idea about revenue stream, Steve, I get it. You know, a revenue stream, it's about the price, the dollar amount I'm charging customers. That's a mistake. And you'll see later that pricing is a tactic. And, or maybe I kind of get it, okay, now I understand that pricing is a tactic, but I'll set the price of the product based on how much it costs me to make it. Well, how else would you set pricing? Cost me 99 cents to make it, I'll charge $1.25, and, you know, that's a kind of a reasonable price. We'll also see why that might be a huge mistake in leaving lots of money on the table. And then kind of the third common error is my price has to be less than my competitor's price. If they're charging $5,000, the best way to enter a market is to charge $4,000. Why? No one would pay any more than the existing incumbents. And we're going to see that's another going out of business strategy. And all this depends on your knowledge that you've just learned about the customers, their reaction to the value proposition, and all the work you've been doing outside the building. You're going to have an incredible advantage in thinking about revenue and pricing. So the two questions we're going to talk about now are, what are my revenue streams? And next, within the revenue streams, how do I price the product? So let's take a look. What exactly is a revenue stream? A revenue stream is the strategy the company uses to generate cash from each customer segment. So if you have multiple customer segments, you may have multiple revenue streams. We'll go into this in some detail, but let's define pricing. Pricing are the tactics you use to set the price. How many dollars or pounds or is it free in each of these customer segments? So now let's go back and look at the revenue stream in some detail first couple of questions you need to answer is number one what value are customers willing to pay for well how do you know this well on day one you're just sitting in your building or in your classroom or in your lab and you're guessing you're going hey these are my customers guess you know th these are the features they care about guess this is the value they're gonna pay for guess but by now you've been in front of a ton of customers you've talked to them just extensively, and you understand what it is they value. And that's what we're going to use to figure out what the revenue streams and pricing are. The next thing that you actually found out outside the building was how do customers pay for products today? Also, you want to understand how much are they paying. So how do they pay and how much do they pay? So for big picture, let's go take a look at the revenue stream choices at the highest possible level. So I've just told you the difference between revenue streams and pricing models, but let's take a look at an example. So imagine I have 15 sales reps and they cover 27 cities in the United States and they're traveling all the time and they work for me. And by the way, my product, its material cost is $99 and I've decided I'm going to add a $30 gross margin on top of it, so I sell the product for $129. So why don't you think about this for a second and tell me which part was the revenue stream and which part was the pricing tactic? 
Are the sales reps in 27 cities the revenue stream? Or are the cost plus $30 the revenue stream? Was the pricing tactics the sales rep? Or was it the cost plus the gross margin? Another type of sale is an actual asset sale, direct sale. This is sale of ownership of the right to a physical product. Uh, and in a physical channel, some best examples are, you know, buying cars, Ford or General Motors or Nissan, or going into a Walmart, buying products in their massive stores, or going to your local hardware store and buying some thermometers. Or as we said earlier, there could be a usage fee strategy. And the fee is proportional to how much of the service you used. What's an example of companies that do usage fees? Well, every time you use your cell phone, either for voice or data, you're paying a fee proportional to the services. Or if you're a web developer, Amazon's web service has been the kind of the reason why the web has exploded because you no longer need to buy hardware, but you're paying per computing or per database size or anything else. Or FedEx. You're now paying for every envelope or package you ship. Or what's really interesting is electric power. Always used to be metered in proportional to the service, but now new solar companies have decided that instead of selling solar panels, their business model is we'll install the panels for free, but we'll also become a utility. These are usage fee revenue strategies. Subscription fee. Instead of paying per use, why don't we pay kind of a flat fee every month for continuous access to a service? What's an example of that? Well, Salesforce.com. We pay literally for a continued use of the product, or maybe a better example is Netflix with all you could eat downloads uh, for videos. Want to watch infinite number of movies? You pay just a flat subscription fee. There are other revenue models like renting. We rent houses. Uh, but the best example for me is a Chegg in the book business. Now all of a sudden, I could temporarily rent books or borrow lenses, which says, listen, instead of buying expensive camera gear, which you might just use intermittently for photo shoots, like expensive Hasselblads or expensive lenses, why don't you just go in and rent them for a temporary amount of time? And, of course, in the U.S. and overseas, car rentals are the exact example for transportation. Instead of buying a car in every city, when you get off a plane, it's very easy, and we just kind of take for granted that you could have temporary access to automobiles, drive them for hours or days, and return them. Another type of revenue model is licensing. It's a fee for use for intellectual property, IP. What's an example of using somebody's IP? I can't think of one. Well, if you ever used any software from any computer manufacturer, congratulations, if you ever read the fine print from Microsoft or Electronic Arts or even Apple, you don't own your software. You're actually using it under a license. Surprise! That means you can't duplicate it and make a million copies and give it away to your friends. You have agreed with Microsoft or Electronic Arts that you're just licensing it for use on one computer or if they're feeling generous this year maybe your laptop and your phone and one desktop machine but you do not have infinite rights to their intellectual property. Another type of revenue strategy could be an intermediation fee. Now sometimes we find this in marketplaces and it's a fee for bringing two parties together involved in a transaction. What's an example? Well, the most popular one right now is Airbnb. They don't own all those places they're renting, but what they do is essentially a dating service between you and someone who wants to make money in renting their apartment for a night or a couple nights. So you, the traveler who need a place to stay but don't want to stay in an expensive hotel, use their site as an intermediary. Or Etsy, or even better, Cafe Press, or E-Trade. All these are kind of brokers. And by the way, in the physical world, the classic is real estate brokers. And they don't own the house, and they don't own you, but they're a matchmaking service for between you and the property you want to buy. Another strategy for a revenue stream could be advertising. So again, if you remember our conversation about Google, Google's strategy and Facebook and Spice and Mint, it's all about creating massive numbers of users 
so I could monetize, fancy name for make money from, all those users, not from making them pay, because last time I looked, the Google search didn't cost me anything directly, but Google is actually using me to sell to advertisers. They're saying, hey, you want to get in front of people like Steve? All you have to do is pay us for access to these groups of individuals. And in fact, if we're very sophisticated, we could segment them by specific keywords or interests. So let's take a look and see if we understand revenue streams. On the top, we have some example of uh, revenue stream possibilities. We could have direct, ancillary, asset, usage, or subscription. Why don't we match the best examples that go in each box? Why don't you put the number that corresponds to what you think the best examples are in the boxes underneath the revenue stream examples on the top? So obviously, direct, that would be a direct sales force, number four. Ancillary would be number two, referral revenue. An example of an asset revenue stream would be number six, sale of ownership. Usage would be proportional users, number seven. And subscriptions would certainly be number five, but also could be number one. Now in summary, revenue streams might take the form of a whole series of potential strategies. But what's interesting is inside of each revenue stream, you may have different pricing tactics. Let me say that again. We t just talked about revenue streams. If you think about it, we didn't talk about how much to charge. We talked about the potential ways to charge, licensing and intermediation and, and direct sales, etc. But how do you think about pricing itself? How do you set prices? So let's take a look. Pricing is kind of the tactics. First thing is you have to figure out what's the revenue stream I'm going to use for the customer segment. But there are two types of prices. One is fixed pricing. Fixed pricing is just like it sounds. There's no haggling. Here's how it is. It's the fixed price. Now, fixed price, you could decide, well, how do I set that price? I'm going to take the cost of what it takes me to build the product, and I'm going to add some fixed markup, you know, whatever I think my profit should be. And it's very simple. It's cost plus markup. And this gets me to the minimum price in the market. But you know what? I might know something that my competitors don't know. Because I've been out talking to these customers for weeks or months, and I know that they actually value my feature set, my value proposition, more than my competitors. And in an existing market, I like know something no one knows. I know exactly how much they value what I will offer. So instead of pricing based on cost, I could actually price on specific customer segments or on features I know they need. There's a third type of fixed pricing, and that's called volume pricing. It might be that you want to encourage high volume because you have economies of scale. And so you might price the product if you buy in quantities of 1 to 10, it's $1,000. But if you buy in quantities of 10 to 100, it's $900. And therefore, you could keep stepping up the discount. But boy, if you buy in you know, hundreds of thousands or millions, instead of $1,000, we'll charge you $99. You know who does that? Go talk to Intel and the semiconductor manufacturers. They want to encourage high volume purchases. And so they have stepped pricing that is oriented to create volume. So cost plus markup, value pricing, and volume price are all examples of fixed pricing tactics. But there's another type of pricing. That's dynamic pricing. And dynamic pricing it's exactly what it sounds like. Dynamic means it moves. Well, how can you have prices that kind of move? I thought all pricing is written down on a piece of paper and never changes. Well, if you ever think about it, pricing that you negotiate, yeah, we kind of have this price on paper, but that's just the starting point of a conversation. So negotiated prices is a dynamic price. But airlines are now a great example of another type of dynamic pricing, and that's called yield management. If you think about it, once an airplane takes off, they could no longer sell those seats. So a month before the flight, those seats might be 
$500. A week before, those seats might actually go up to $600. An hour before, those seats might drop down to $99 because that's planes leaving. And if we have empty seats, we're not getting any revenue. And so yield management is actually pretty interesting uh, based on experience, on time, etc. And there's software programs and industries like airlines and car rentals, etc. that have perishable seats or time actually are quite good at doing this. Another type of dynamic pricing are real-time markets. Stock market is a real-time market. And then auctions like eBay, another example of dynamic pricing. So again, two types of pricing models, fixed and dynamic. How do you know which one to use? You've been out talking to customers. How do they currently buy? And what's the revenue stream that's associated with these kind of pricing tactics? You need to be constantly thinking, what's the right revenue stream for the right segment? And within that, what's the right pricing model? Is it fixed or is it dynamic? And which one are you going to pick? So we just talked about the two categories of pricing tactics we can have. Fixed pricing tactics and dynamic pricing tactics. Take a look at the choices here on the left and match them to whether they're fixed or dynamic. It turns out we made this pretty easy. The first three, cost-based pricing, value-based pricing, or volume-based pricing, are all examples of fixed pricing tactics. And that just means that the last three, yield management, real-time, and auctions, are examples of dynamic pricing. A couple of mistakes right on tactics I just want to remind you about. I mentioned them earlier, but a common startup error on day one is let's price on cost. We know how much it takes to build our product. We'll just add a markup that is a profit, and, and therefore we have a price. Well, how hard can that be? This is typically not a strategic way to price. You might end up here, but boy, there's a lot more moves on the table. What you really want to think about is not just your internal economics, but the customer insight that you actually have. So I want you to think about, yes, pricing on cost is maybe the first place we start, but are we leaving a ton of money on the table? Because the alternative to pricing on cost is pricing on value. As we said earlier, you now know your customer segment's perception of the value of your value prop. Is it about time saved, new efficiency created? Remember we talked earlier about pains and gains for this customer segment. What is it that they value? Why are you saving them a ton of money? Now, customers don't necessarily feel that they want to pay this way, but smart marketeers and smart startup executives can convince customers that instead of paying on cost, they really ought to be thinking about that your company is unique in providing the most value, not just the cheapest product. Now, one other thing affects pricing, and we should think about it. In an existing market, if you remember our discussion about market type, we have existing markets, we resegment markets, we might have be in a new market, or if we're uh, in a country outside the United States, we might be cloning an existing business model. But if we're in an existing market, we got to kind of think about competition. Is there a monopoly? Is there a duopoly, an oligopoly? That is, are there dominant players that really kind of shape the pricing in our market? And what we really want to understand is, what's their product? What are their costs and prices? And what pricing will make them feel the worst? And more importantly, can we do strategies like bracket them? Can we undercut them? Can we niche or blue ocean strategy them? And so these are the things you want to think about if there are dominant players in an existing market. Uh, you want to actually have pricing as a strategy, not just a reaction. One of the things I, I just want to reemphasize, because we mentioned it earlier, is the difference between single-sided markets and multi-sided markets. Now, single-sided markets, the customer is the user and the payer. That's a single-sided market. There are no separate users and there are no separate payers. You're it. Congratulations. You're the customer and you're going to pay for it. But in multi-sided markets, there might be users, but there also might be very separate people who are payers. And the example we keep using is Google because everybody uh, around the world has probably had at one time or another been a Google user. 
And when you use the Google search bar, you're one side of a multi-sided market. You're the user, but you're not the payer. You're not paying for the product. But in reality, you're paying implicitly because there is another side. The other side are the people using Google AdWords to look for keywords. And in multi-sided markets, the company, your startup, typically cares about acquiring a massive amount of users and then figuring out how to monetize those users next. Google decided to go for millions and then tens of millions of users, and then the keywords came after. Now, depending on your investors, this might be their strategy. I tend to prefer uh, that we actually try to look for who the payers are as early as possible, but this is a question you might want to ask your investors. Do we go for lots of users and then say, ah, oh, if we get 10 million people, the revenues will come? Or do we want to look at both sides of the market at the same time? Again, if you're in a physical channel, my suggestion is you want to take a look at users and payers simultaneously. If you say your business is advertising based, some of the tactics are, how do you get to 10 million monthly users? How do you become one of the top five websites? And how much do the payers actually pay? Now, if you wait two years to find this out, you might have gotten 10 million of the wrong users. So your job is not only to talk to the users in a multi-sided market, your job is to get out of the building and talk to the payers because you have a hypothesis. An important one is how much will those payers pay for the users you think you're collecting? Guess what? If you're wrong, the time to know about it is now, not two years from now. And it's okay to be wrong because most startups all you have is a series of hypotheses, and it's really easy to get caught up in the passion that says, well, if we get all these people, obviously these people will pay us lots of money. But as soon as we get out of the building, that obviously might turn into maybe not. And so what we want to do is get the facts as quickly as we can and then iterate and pivot. And so don't worry if your assumptions were wrong here on your revenue model. You just want to find it out before you start burning a lot of cash and building a lot of value prop around the wrong model. There are other companies who want to go for revenue first. Typically hardware companies, but not always, sometimes on the web as well. And so the questions to ask is, how long will it take to start doubling my revenue every month? When will I get to $100,000 a month? When will I get to a million dollars a month? And what are the, my assumptions about my business when I reach these milestones? What's changed to get there? And so there's nothing magic about these numbers, but when you start asking about, oh, yeah, when am I going to get to 100000 What What has to happen in all those other pieces of the business model? Because if you think about it, you've been working hard on value prop, and you've been working hard on, on customer segments and, and uh, customer acquisition and, and activation and channel. What did you need to do to get the first $100,000 a month, first million dollar a month? Boy, as a startup, you feel great when those happen. Now, the last thing I, I think I really want to mention, and it really does belong in this lecture, is the effect of market type on revenue. And this is really interesting because you might have heard about startups about something called the hockey stick. And the hockey stick is actually this kind of curve. Now, it turns out what the hockey stick really represents are startups in a new market. Wow. Well, that's kind of interesting. Why? Well, if you think about it, in a new market on year one, you have no customers. And so your revenue is essentially flat. And year two, revenue still might be flat. R year three, it might be flat. Year four, oh my gosh, something changed about the market. There might be a tipping point, an inflection point, where sales literally go exponential and start to skyrocket. What happened is a market that didn't exist, all things have just come together and it's become the year of online education or it's become the year of the network or it's become the year of the mobile phone or smartphone. The unfortunate part is most startups who are in a new market see something that look like this and go out of business. So what we're really hoping for is we could influence and affect this tipping point by our customer strategies, our value proposition, and our get, keep, and grow strategies. But the key idea is we want to hoard as much cash as we can 
because almost no startup in a new market can affect the diffusion of innovation by itself. Other things need to happen. And by the way, this little bump in year one, this represents the fallacy in new markets. Because in almost every new market, you could find crazy people just like you who'd be happy to buy one for their lab or their home or something. They're just so, such early adopters, they want to have one. And startup founders look at that curve and say, look, it's just going to look like this, and start scaling their sales and marketing and spending, and then it all collapses again because it really was an, just an early adopter sign, not mainstream adoption. So we want to be careful uh, about what our sales curve looks like. Now, what's really interesting is if we're in an existing market, and remember, in an existing market, what do we know? Well, there are customers and there are competitors. And what we have is, by our definition, a better or higher performance product on axes that the customers have defined. So our job in an existing market is simply year after year, if we execute pristinely, simply to take share away from the incumbents. And so our sales curve in an existing market literally should be one of taking share. And finally, in a resegmented market, this is kind of a hybrid of both new and existing. And what's happening in years one, two, three, et cetera, in the early days, is you're actually getting revenue from the existing market. That is, people might actually kind of find you are an okay substitute, but really don't understand your unique value until some tipping point where they realize, oh my gosh, you're just not another vendor in an existing market. You actually solve better a set of needs for a niche or a, you're a low-cost supplier that really makes you unique and special and revenues take off. And so what you have to do is husband your cash, but not as much in a new market, and figure out how to get you differentiated from the mainstream in existing. So in summary and revenue model, for this class, the best thing that you could do is start drawing the diagram. So what I want you to do is draw the diagram of both your revenue streams and your pricing, and I want you to actually put numbers in it. So let's assume this is your company over here. And what you've discovered is that there are three different customer segments. Look at that. Tenants and property owners and leasing companies. I want to know, is this a subscription? What is the revenue stream that you have between each one of these customer segments? And what are the pricing tactics? And then how do you make money and what do you provide? And all of a sudden, you could now see both the revenue stream and the pricing going back and forth. I just really believe if you could draw it, you have a handle on understanding it. And don't worry, on day one is if it, you start drawing it and realize, well, I really don't understand this stuff. That's just a signal, time to get out of the building again, talk to some more people, and say, well, how are we going to make money here? Because I can't even explain it to myself. Let's take a look at our Jersey Square team. And because they understand their archetype was interested in both subscription and rental, uh, let's see what they were thinking. And they said, well, let's see, one particular model could be an annual subscription, which is a strategy, and here's the tactic at $199 per year. And we could give them um, authentic top-of-line jerseys and free shipping and send a jersey back in exchange for another. And we could offer them either a yearly price or we could offer them a monthly price, which would cost more, but wouldn't commit them for such a longer period of time, but they would get the exact same features. They discovered there was another archetype, another customer segment, that was a casual users. And these people just wanted a one-time use for a one-week rental for a particular game. Well, you get a top-of-line jersey and you get shipping, but the goal was you send the jersey back within one week and we won't charge you for the jersey, and that's a rental. So they had three pricing models they were now going to A-B test for price elasticity. So some of the revenue uh, model questions, what is it my customers are paying for? What's the value? What is it when they look at my company and my products? And by the way, what capacity do they have to pay? They might love it. In fact, everybody who looks at a Ferrari or a Tesla Model S might say, well, yes, I'd love to pay for that, but you know what? My wife won't let me, or, or I just don't have the money. That is, is the total available market you know, uh, of potential users. 
equal to your needs for revenue. You might have built a product so expensive that the customer segment you've targeted just can't afford it. And then how will you package your product? And package, I don't mean what kind of pretty box is it in. Another mistake startups make, particularly engineering-driven startups, is putting every possible feature into the first product, not thinking that perhaps, well, wait a minute, maybe we could kind of decompose the product, that is, take it apart, and offer these as add-ons or as ancillary products or separate products, etc. So how will you package your product should not just be an engineering functionality decision, it should be a value-based decision. And as we said, the same with pricing. How will you price? What kind of tactics will you use? Another thing to think about is, what's the market size estimate? How big is this? And what's the percentage market share realistically you could get? How many can your distribution channel actually sell? And if you have your own direct sales people, do the math. How many customers can they call on at what price? And as you start putting all this into a spreadsheet, you'll actually start building the classic income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow we haven't even had you do yet. If you think about this, this entire conversation we've had was how to get the basic data so you can put together a revenue model that's based on fact rather than fiction. And you are going to start thinking about, well, if I have a direct sales force, how, how much can they sell in dollars or if I'm using an indirect channel, what's a realistic number they sell for other customers? How much will it cost to have a, this distribution channel? Hopefully in the last lecture you start thinking about the cost of your channel. How many customer activations? How much will it cost to get customers into my physical store or my virtual website? And then as we talked about earlier, uh, how much will it cost to acquire a customer? And by the way, not only is how, how much is my customer acquisition cost, but what's their lifetime value? How many units will they buy from each of these efforts? So let's take a look and see how our Jersey Score team is doing in figuring out their revenue streams. That is, how much money each segment is willing to pay, and how would they like to pay this amount? So what they discovered, as we found out earlier, is that they have two customer segments, sport jersey owners and single game attendees. And as you would think, that the single game attendees would actually like to pay per rental. That is, you were going to rent a jersey for one-time use, from Jersey Square. But the people who already own sport jerseys kind of like the idea of an annual subscription. And now, getting out of the building, they actually talk to enough customers and have enough data to realize that these sports jersey owners would pay $200 a year to get a clean, pressed, dry clean jersey for each game. It isn't clear yet. Uh, in their customer discovery process how much the single game attendees will pay but they intend to talk to more customers and fill in that data. 